Good morning and welcome to Trevor Phillips on Sunday, live from the G7 Summit in Cornwall. The thing about these big family gatherings is that they always start with broad smiles and pleasantries, but frankly, after drinks are taken, old animosities can bubble to the surface and then things end up in the car park. Well, meetings of world leaders are, frankly, no different. Boris Johnson is already fending off attacks, particularly from his EU colleagues. Yesterday he said that they need to get it into their heads that Northern Ireland is part of the UK in the row over checks in the Irish Sea. But the Irish Prime Minister, uh, Michael Martin, told Sky News that it's time for the UK to show the will to end the row. Well, how's it all going to end? We don't know. But we are pretty sure that there will be smiles and there will be jokes this afternoon, but they may mask deeper tensions that will last into the future. Today we've got a bumper lineup to react to everything that's happened here in Cornwall. In just a moment, I'll be joined by the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab. We'll be hearing from Ireland's Prime Minister, Michael Martin, with his strong message for Boris Johnson. The former UK Prime Minister Gordon Brown will be giving his reaction to world leaders' plans to donate vaccines to the developing world. Labour's Shadow International Trade Secretary Emily Thornbury will be giving her reaction to the summit, as will the former Conservative International Development Secretary Andrew Mitchell. And as the government prepares to delay the lifting of lockdown on June the 21st, we'll be hearing from their advisor on COVID and ethnicity, Dr. Rahib. Ali. But first, I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab. Foreign Secretary, good morning. Good morning now, um, I know it's not over until it's over, but what can we expect to hear and what do you hope to hear from the Prime Minister uh, this afternoon? Well, look, the, uh, we've seen the worst crisis probably since the Second World War. And I think, if we're all honest, a sense countries have perhaps been going their own way. And what this G7 summit under the UK presidency and the Prime Minister's uh, chairmanship has delivered is a, a, a global gear shift in international collaboration. Now, you're going to get the full communique at 2 o'clock, just in time for the football. Um, mm -hmm. But let me just give you a sense of what's going to be in there. We led the way with uh, our offer of 100 million vaccines from our surplus domestic supply. We now believe that we've got a commitment for a billion doses to go to vaccinating the world by the middle of next year. The current trajectory had us on the end of 2024. So that is a game changer in dealing with the pandemic and getting the world back to normal. On climate change, G7 leaders have previously committed to net zero by... Uh, 2050, what we've got is a series of commitments to halve emissions by 2030 and a whole range of uh, commitments to not just end coal but end the finance of coal. So I think you're going to see that global gear shift and that's what Global Britain's all about. We hear the gear shift but honestly uh, a lot of this probably could have been done uh, after 18 months where we've done things by Zoom. Actually, did we need all the ballyhoo to get that done? I think it was settled before they all got here. No, it hasn't been. I can tell you from my own personal experience. We, this is the first net zero G7 summit, by the way. So we're talking the talk, not just uh, walking the walk, not just talking the talk. But actually, you do need to get leaders around uh, the table. If you want to stop this sort of fragmentation, if you want to see global cooperation, if you want to deliver that global gear shift in international cooperation, which the Prime Minister has been at the vanguard of, you've got to get the leaders together. Let's, let's talk about the big issue that's for today, and that is the billion uh, vaccine doses. Um, the head of the WHO and also the Common Secretary, Commonwealth Secretary General and others are saying it's really not enough. The number they're looking for is 11 billion and they want them sooner. Isn't this just feeling a bit like a gesture rather than a real way of solving the problem of the developing world? Well, of course, uh, the, the extra doses that have been achieved are a billion, but that's two billion in total uh, that, the, that, that has been uh, uh, committed to by the G7. And we've been leading the way. Um, but look, the, the, no, let, let me... There's a big, big gap between one billion so, and 11 billion. So let me show you. Let me just demonstrate for your viewers what that means. If we carried on the current trajectory, we wouldn't have the world vaccinated till the end of 2024. And what we've now shifted that, if we can deliver on that, which I'm confident we will today, is that by the 
middle of next year the world will be vaccinated. That's 18 months difference. That is a massive step change. Of course we want to go further and faster. And of course it's worth remembering that we pioneered £90 million of taxpayers' money into the AstraZeneca vaccine. 95% of the COVAX vaccines going to the poorest countries of the world and now because of the AZ vaccine and because of that investment. The problem is, though, the Foreign Secretary, is speed. It's speed. Uh, next year isn't going to be fast enough. We're seeing in our own country, we're having to turn on a sixpence because this thing develops so fast. And come back to what the head of the WHO is saying. We need more vaccines faster. And actually giving a billion, fine, but actually it won't stop this thing getting out of control. Shouldn't we really be thinking about putting more resources in now and getting more vaccines across to people now. Well, we, well, that's what we're doing. I mean, the extra billion comes in now. It, it expedites. More than the billion. It exp well, of course, it's easy to say at the end of a summit when everyone said it was impossible and we've shifted the dial by 18 months in terms of world vaccination, say it's not enough. I think actually people will understand that is a massive step change and it's one where the UK has led the way and of course we've, uh, you know, we've got our own domestic uh, rollout. We're, we're doing very well, but we've got enough uh, certainty of supply that we could give 100 million. That has a, a vaccine, uh, excess vaccines, that has helped galvanise, and the Prime Minister has been able to say, look, we're leading by example, come on, join the effort. But just very quick, it is a matter of priorities, isn't it? You say in the integrated review document that you've published, very proud of, that you're outspending the NATO target. We're undershooting our overseas development target. Uh, the point is, are you getting the priorities right? We're spending more money on guns, perhaps we ought to be spending more resources and time and getting vaccines into people's arms. Well, look, I, I don't think it's a zero-sum game. A lot of the work we do, for example, I've seen in East Africa, training uh, countries like the, the peacekeepers to put out uh, explosives, uh, improvised explosive devices that Al-Shabaab are laying, are also about development. I don't think there's a zero-sum game. In terms of development, I mean, actually, the third thing I was going to point to is what we're doing on girls' education. The Prime Minister has been driving 40 million more girls into 12 years' education. We have put the biggest contribution into the Global Partnership for Education, 430 million. I think you'll see in the communique, okay. billions extra coming from other countries to hit I, that target. I want to come back to that, but uh, let me just uh, ask you about what the Prime Minister of Ireland has been saying this, this morning. He told Sky News that a practical arrangement on Northern Ireland could be reached. Yet the Prime Minister yesterday said that he was ready to invoke Article 16 of Northern Ireland Protocol, essentially putting a stop. And that's it's pretty belligerent, isn't it, when the Irish are saying, let's make a, a deal. Uh, you're, you're the chief diplomat for the government. Uh, are you going to be telling the Prime Minister when he speaks this afternoon, cool it? The, look, the Prime Minister has been very calm, but also firm about this. What we've yeah, seen... Article 16 is a bit previous, well, isn't let it? Me, let me answer the, 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 the challenge that you rightly make. We've seen uh, a very lopsided approach to the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is supposed to protect all communities in Northern Ireland, not just the EU equities, but also, um, Article 6, you'll be familiar with it, the free flow of trade and goods between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. That hasn't happened. Fully one in five of all of the EU checks and controls to protect its border from Central and Eastern in Europe, through around to the south of the, of the continent, up to Northern Ireland. One in five takes place in Northern Ireland. That cannot be right. So what we want is a more proportionate, flexible approach. If Michal Martin is willing yeah. to press the Commission on that, fantastic. We want tensions eased. Uh, we want a flexible, pragmatic approach. What we cannot have is both the Northern Ireland pr Protocol being applied in a very lopsided way, or the Good Friday Agreement being undermined as a result well, of it. Well, you're, you're talking about the way it's applied, but let's, let's just get back to basics. You sign the thing, then the EU is sticking to the letter of the deal. They're not. Now, now, you're, saying, the now you're saying, let's, let's be a bit more practical, let's be a bit, a bit more flexible. No, no, Why no. did you sign the deal in the first place? No, no, that's an inaccurate... This was coming. Trevor, that was an, that's an inaccurate characterisation. Of course, the Northern Ireland Protocol is a package. It's got bits uh, to protect the EU equities. It's got bits to protect the free flow of goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. For example, trade facilitation under Article 6. The problem is the Commissioner insisting on a very lopsided, purist approach. If we have a sensible, pragmatic, flexible approach and we put loads of well, proposals to the well, other side, well, if they're now in a position to come back and show the, well, the flexibility... Because, you know, when yeah. this happens in Northern Ireland, Island, it has real-life effects on the communities and the businesses there. OK, let me, let me stop you there. Your colleague Lord Frost says it's legalistic, by which he means it's what's down there in the paper 
and you're saying it's purist, but it is the deal. No. You want it to operate in a different way from what it says on the paper. And that might be perfectly reasonable, but you've got to accept the EU are not in the wrong in saying, this is what we agreed, why don't you stick to it? Trevor, your assumption and premise, I'm afraid, is flawed. I've given you one example, Article 6, which talks about free-flowing trade between uh, measures to facilitate the free flow of trade between Britain and Northern Ireland. There's many others. And the, the truth is the Northern Ireland Protocol is a compromise. What we need is both the letter and the spirit to be respected. We've come up with proposals. We've given them to the Commission. Uh, what we cannot have is the continuing disruption of trade and effectively trying to change the status of Northern Ireland, contrary to the wishes or the consent of the people, which is not just contrary to the Northern Ireland Protocol, but also the Belfast Agreement. Let's stick with the diplomacy uh, issue. Um, is it right that President Macron said that Northern Ireland was not part of the United Kingdom and the, he was rebuked by the Prime Minister? Well I, well, I don't do uh, as a matter of diplomatic professionalism come out and spill the beans. What I can tell you is no one should be surprised by these reports. And it's not just one figure. We have serially seen senior EU figures talk about Northern Ireland as if it was somehow a different country from the UK. That is not only offensive, it has real world effects on the communities in Northern Ireland, creates great concern, great consternation. But also, Trevor, could you imagine if we talked about Catalonia, the Flemish part of Belgium, one of the lander in Germany, Northern uh, Italy, Corsica in France as different countries. We need a bit of respect here and also, frankly, an appreciation of the situation for all communities in Northern Ireland. Yeah, but uh, let's come back again to the same point. You signed the deal and why would they not think that way? Well, the deal has countless provisions protecting all sorts of equities. You're, you're we... shifting the goalposts again, no, I'm Sovereign not. Secretary. No, I'm not. Let me answer, let me answer, because I, I accept the challenge that you're putting down. But in a deal which has a package reflecting provisions that protect EU equities, but also protect uh, the integrity of the UK, both sides of that deal must be implemented. Our challenge back to the EU is you're doing this in a lopsided way. If they want to now come to the table with flexibility, goodwill and pragmatism, we would love to see this issue resettled. Because for us, the key issue, amidst some of the ignorant comments that have been made about Northern Ireland, what else really matters is the businesses from all communities, the livelihoods, the, 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 the sense of consternation and anxiety in communities on all sides in Northern Ireland. We need to give them that reassurance. This is all about leadership. Um, does it show great leadership for uh, the world's leaders to gather at a barbie where there are more than 30 people, more than a limit, that ordinary people will be able to have at their weddings and where the only people wearing masks were the staff. Now, I can understand that there will be all sorts of precautions and so on, but it's not a good look, is it? Look, it's outside. You can see it's very well ventilated on the on the beach. We've done. We've yeah, taken. But all... If I have a wedding, I can only have thirty well, uh, inside or I outside. I think, in fairness, Trevor, both in terms of the checks that have been done, the daily checks for COVID, um, the the precautions, the slimline delegations, we have taken every measure possible to make sure this is not just uh, COVID secure, but able to take place. And I think we've gone well beyond and above in terms of make sure, making sure that this is COVID secure. So um, it's a pretty good signal that if you're having a wedding and you can have it outside, you can probably have more than 30 people and uh, not wear a mask. Well, the G7 is not 30 people, but the... There were more than 30 people at the barbecue. Well, I, the, I, 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 the pictures I, I, are all out there. The, 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 there was social distancing that, that was... They were not that, social was, distancing. Well, well, you know, Trevor, we, we look very carefully at this. I mean, this. Hon honestly, I, I'm not blaming you for this, Foreign Secretary. All I'm saying is it's out there and actually maybe somebody tripped up, maybe somebody made a mistake, but it's out there and people will be reasonably saying... You're not allowing me to gather with my friends and family at a wedding or a funeral, but look at what you guys well, are doing. In, in fairness, uh, there, have, there have always been different uh, principles for social entertainment or weddings than for government business. Now, you may make uh, light of barbecues. One rule for the Powerful? Uh, no, no, no. Those rules have been the same all along. Okay. But I think people will understand. I think your viewers will understand the serious business of bringing leaders together okay. to bring back the economy stronger, okay. greener, deal with the pandemic, shift the point at which the whole world is vaccinated from 2024 to the middle of um, uh, next year. That's a serious business that they're engaged in uh, amidst all of the, uh, okay. the, the, the leisure activities on the beach. Straightforward question. 21st of June, will restrictions be lifted or not? 
Well, as you know, the Prime Minister will set out the proposition tomorrow. We're in a race against, if you like, uh, to roll out the second dose of the vaccine against the variants. We need to assess the data very carefully. We've done a great job with this vaccine rollout. But as the PM said, we want to proceed irreversibly, and that means we need to do it carefully and cautiously. So it feels like... We're in a realm where we could be backing I off. I can't account, Trevor, how you okay. feel this morning, but I can tell you that you'll get the full answers tomorrow. Let's talk about the Harry Dunn case. Have you given up on the possibility of Anne Sekoulas, the American uh, diplomat or diplomat's wife, uh, returning to the United Kingdom to face justice? This is a heartbreaking case. I've been liaising, of course, with the family. And what we've said is that we would ask the new administration its position on the extradition request. Their position hasn't changed. But we've also wanted to be clear, and the president, uh, uh, the prime minister discussed it with the president uh, here at Carbis Bay, that there ought to be no uh, obstacles, if you like, politically, to the lawyers, the CPS talking to Anne lawyers. There's no, no objection to them having a conversation to see whether a virtual trial could be done, which can ensure accountability and some measure of solace for the family. And that's, uh, and that's what has been agreed. Did, did you raise the question of extradition with President Biden? The Prime Minister did, yes. He asked uh, President Biden whether it would be possible to extradite this individual well, from the United States to so, Britain. So both myself with Secretary of State Blinken, but also the PM with the President, and of course at official level, have tested very carefully whether the fundamental position on the extradition request has changed. It hasn't. We've pressed this. Um, but equally, uh, if that is not possible, and we've made our, clear, our position clear, there's been a denial of justice, we want to see the obstacles removed, that at least uh, the lawyers on all sides can discuss whether it's possible to have a virtual trial. And I think that's a step forward alongside the civil suit that I've been supporting, that the family have been taking in America. Geopolitics now. Um... The American president is going to meet Mr. Putin later on this week. Henry Kissinger says in a new book of essays uh, by Gordon Brown that um, we're heading for a new Cold War between liberal democracies like ours and authoritarians, Russia and China. And you actually, in your integrated review, say that Russia will remain the most acute direct threat to the United Kingdom. Do you agree with Kissinger, new Cold War? No, I don't quite like the analogy because it looks back and we had a, a bipolar world in those days, effectively, USSR and the US uh, with its allies, and we have a much more multipolar world today. But what I do see is the threat that Russia poses on the border with Ukraine with the build-up of troops, uh, the, uh, the use of a chemical weapon on Alexei Navalny, hot on the heels of what we saw in Salisbury, uh, its use of cyber attacks in a way which is totally different from the Cold War. Uh, we're seeing cyber not just from Russia and not just from the Russian state used to attack schools, hospitals. Uh, we've got to adapt to the new threats that we face. We will do so by being absolutely clear with Russia and other hostile states that we will hold them to account and apply a cost for their malign behaviour. Equally, we would like to get the relationship onto a better footing. The door of, uh, uh, of uh, diplomacy is always ajar, always open for better behaviour. I noticed in that answer you didn't mention China. Now, um... It's because you asked me about Russia. Uh, no, I said that you picked out Russia as a specific threat, but the Americans clearly are more worried about China, which is... Uh, but the integrated, let, but let's, let's, let's the integrated review is littered with how okay. we will deal with China. Well, well let's talk about China. Um, did you discuss, uh, as I think the head of the World Health Organization has suggested, have you discussed the Wuhan uh, leak, or alleged leak, this weekend? Uh, I haven't personally, but of course it's uh, created uh, uh, part of the backdrop and officials have been comparing notes on this. If you're asking me whether we think, on the balance of probabilities if you like, that it originated in a lab, our best information for now is that it didn't. But we don't have all the answers. That's why internationally we wanted the review to be able to go in uh, uh, to uh, China uh, to get all the answers, to have all the cooperation, so we have the full picture rather than these possible, potential, plausible options. But on balance, we do not believe that it came from a laboratory. We think it's much more likely to have been, to have jumped, if you like, from animals to humans. Can I come back to, very briefly at the end, uh, to uh, an issue that uh, looked like was going to be a big question last week, which is the foreign aid um, uh, budget, which um, you, avo you avoided, let's put it that way, but it's going to come back. Here is the issue that Andrew Mitchell and other rebel Tory MPs are raising. Is it right, is it the right priority for the government to be putting yet more money into defence and so on, but taking effectively £4 billion out of what was anticipated in foreign aid. 
doesn't that mean you can send more troops to Mali, but you will be withdrawing money from the girls' education you talked about, from water, uh, clean water programmes, and so on? Actually, doesn't that really create a problem for us? We're not exercising the soft power we should because we're putting the money in the wrong place. Well, look, I don't accept the binary uh, uh, siloing of what we do for security of countries from their, uh, the soft power and the aid we put in. You gave the example of Mali. We put in 300 extra UK troops precisely to stabilise, not for any particular raw, direct national security threat to the UK, but to stabilise that region. But clinics in that region. Now, 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 you then asked me about girls' education. Actually, at this... Um, summit, we've announced £430 million for the Global Partnership for Education. That is the biggest donation we've ever made. Now, of course, because of the impact of the pandemic on the public finances, we've had, a, we've had to uh, reprioritise. I think people at home would, would think it was odd if we were reprioritising other budgets, but we didn't even look at the uh, international budgets. But we're putting okay. in £10 billion pounds in aid this year. We're leading by example, the third biggest G7 uh, global contributor. And if you look at this communique out at 2 o'clock, you'll see the good that Global Britain could do. Foreign Secretary, thank you very much for your time this morning. Good to talk to you. We're going to turn now to Labour's uh, international development uh, shadow, Emily Thornbury. Uh, I beg your pardon, International Trade Morning, uh, Secretary. Uh, Emily, <laughs> Emily Thornbury, what did you make of what the Foreign Secretary had to say, particularly on the issue of, that we just um, ended there, on foreign uh, aid and spending? Well, I personally think that it is embarrassing, more than embarrassing, it is simply wrong for us to be the only country in the G7 nations around that table that's actually cutting our aid budget at a time like this. I think that, of course, we have to be doing more work in relation to vaccines, and we should be starting with a bit of international leadership, which is how do we make sure that we increase the amount of vaccine that's available. But that is, that is just not the same issue as ensuring that we continue to invest in the poorest countries and allow them to lift themselves up. At a time like this, with this pandemic, for example, it is obvious that the health systems of many countries are simply not up to and adequate when it comes to you know, being able to give out the vaccine, even if it was available. So it shows once more how important it is that we continue to do the right thing and invest in, in, in international aid. Do you think that... Um... You heard the Prime Minister talk yesterday about building back uh, in a gender-neutral way, in a more feminine way. Um, do you agree with that? And do you think that uh, they, this is, what they're putting forward is a way of achieving that? I don't really understand what he's talking about, to be honest with you. I think what we should be doing is, of course, we should be building back in a way which is better. We should be much more aware of the threat of climate change. That is the single biggest threat that we face. And I think that when people look back on this G7, they will be looking at it and thinking the optics were great. Cornwall has never looked better. It was brilliant having a different type of president coming over. You know, so much was going the right way, but did we really use it as much as we could have, to what extent is this a wasted opportunity? So did we do enough in relation to vaccines? Did we actually get some action to increase the amount of supply? Did we really step up in the way that we must do, as Attenborough has been warning us this morning, to be able to step up and do something about climate change adequately? Not just talking about what we can do within our own countries, but actually how are we, what are we going to do internationally? What are we going to do about ensuring that, we, that the corporations finally pay the right amount of tax? And frankly, they're not. And even this agreement is frankly meagre compared to what it could be. So I think G7 could have been so much more now. Is that feminine? Is that masculine? I don't really care, to be honest with you, Trevor. What I care about is climate change. I care about making sure we've got vaccines. And I, make, and I care about corporations paying their way. The pro Oh, forgive me, there's a delay here, so Sorry, I'm, I'm slightly up. missing what, what you're saying, but that's OK. But um, are you supportive of the Prime Minister's one billion jabs target? I kind of feel as though it's missing the point. I think that, you know, if we say, you know, we will hand over our spare vaccines, that isn't really... The issue is something else. You know, the issue is 
that we, as a, as, a, as a globe, are not making enough vaccine. We don't have enough factories around the world strategically placed making enough vaccines and being able to step up and increase production. In the end, otherwise, if we don't do that, then we will continue to be saying, oh, should this group have it? Should that group have it? Have we handed over enough? We need to make sure that we are producing enough as a world so that you know, when we are all talking about, we may, I hope we don't, but we may in the autumn be talking about the need for top-ups and all of us to have top-ups. We may, I hate to say, in five years' time be talking about another pandemic. One thing we know is that we weren't prepared as a world for this pandemic. We need to make sure that we have a strategy agreed internationally on what it is that we're going to do next. Not just talking about how much do we have to spare that we can share with others. That really isn't addressing the fundamental problem. Labour, in the end, accepted the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, where do you think we've got to in this summit? Uh, the uh, Prime Minister of Ireland this morning told uh, Sky News that he thought that there is a practical arrangement available, but um, the government is saying that the EU is being overly bureaucratic. Uh, do you buy that? I think we just need to get this sorted out. I think it's completely ridiculous. I think that there are plenty of ways it can be sorted out and the government needs to step up and do it. Many things have been suggested to it. Uh, we need to have a veterinary agreement with the EU. We don't have one at the moment. I personally think that the Swiss model is probably the best one that we should have. We should just get on with it. We should, we should understand that when we sign up to international agreements, they are legally binding documents and they need to be taken seriously and we have to find a pragmatic way through this. I'm not saying that the European Union isn't being petty. I'm not saying that the number of stops on the border are frankly ridiculous, that they are sticking within the letter of the law and we need to find a solution to that and solutions are available. We just need to step back, take a deep breath and look beyond the sausages and think, you know, what is the policy that needs to be fixed? And there are plenty of things out there. And as I say, a veterinary agreement along the lines that the Swiss have with the Euro European Union seems to me to be a solution. But there are plenty of others, you know, a whole panoply of different things for them to pick. They just need to get on with it. Emily Thornberry, though, isn't this the Remainer in you speaking, essentially saying, well, look, you know, it's all a bit difficult, but if the EU really want to bear down, we don't want to have a fight. We just have to be a rule taker in this situation. No, look, the United States has a better veterinary agreement with the European Union than we do. We don't have one. We don't have an agreement as to what food needs to cross the border. And I'll tell you why. It's because the government wants to have as much flexibility as possible when it comes to potential other trade deals. So they want to have the potential to lower our farm standards and our food standards in order to be able to accommodate other future trade deals. Frankly, I think they have got this completely the wrong way around. What we should be doing is looking at what is in Britain's interests. They have always said that they will not lower our food and farming standards beyond, below that that there is in the European Union. So if that's right, why can't we just agree that with the European Union? Because they want to keep their options open and they want in future to have the potential to lower food standards, particularly because they're after a trade deal with the United States. And the irony is, here we have the United States president saying, do you know what? The most important thing is not a trade deal between Britain and the United States. The most important thing is the Good Friday Agreement, and we in America are prioritising that, and we think that you and Britain should be doing that too. And I agree. Big choice tomorrow, big choice tomorrow, June the 21st. Should we lift the restrictions, given that actually a lot of countries vaccinated, um, the businesses are crying out, or are you leaning now towards caution on the Labour side? I'm so sorry I didn't hear that question, Trevor. Do you mind asking it again? I, uh, uh, no problem. I was asking you, we have this big decision about June the 21st. Where is Labour standing now? Do you say that we should go ahead, lift the restrictions, free businesses who are crying out and so on, or are you now inclined, given the data, towards caution? We have always been inclined towards more than inclined. We have always said that we must follow the scientific advice. And the scientific advice is pretty clear that we can't have a, 
uh, lifting of the lockdown at the moment. There needs to be uh, more of a delay because of the variant and because of all the other reasons. I just want to be confident that the Prime Minister is listening to that scientific agreement. You know, you do look back and wonder whether you know, now you wonder what on earth were they, did they think they were doing by not closing the borders at the time when they should have. I have no doubt there was no scientific advice telling them not to close the borders because they should have, particularly when the Delta variant started. And, you know, you wonder why it was that they kept the border open, for example, with India and yet closed the border with Pakistan and Bangladesh. I think it was because you know, Boris Johnson continued with the fantasy that he was going to be able, right until the last minute, that he was going to be allowed to go to India and, and sign some sort of pre-trade deal. It's another example of putting trade deals and standing Thank in front you. of flags and signing them up and, and, and so on before the interests of our country. Trade deals ought to be about what are the interests of our, in our country and make sure our trade deals reflect that and build on it, not the other way around. Emily Thornby, thank you, and thank you for coping with uh, the delay here. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for coping with the delays. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let us turn now to a veteran of uh, G7 Summit, the former Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, who has published a couple of essays uh, on international and other policies. Uh, but I want to start, if I may, Gordon Brown, by... So, putting to you, you're the man with experience of these international gatherings. If you were um, in Boris Johnson's shoes today, where, where would you be leading? In a way, given what you uh, experienced back in 2000, 2009, what lessons that w would you have taken from that period uh, to apply to today's international crisis? Yeah, it's up to the chairman, and that's Boris Johnson to lead. Uh, the others would respond. But I think this summit will go down as a, a missed opportunity. Uh, a missed opportunity when we needed 11 billion vaccines. We've only got offered a plan for 1 billion. We needed $50 billion allocated to the vaccination of the world and only $5 billion. And I think this summit, I'm afraid, will also go down as an unforgivable moral failure when the richest countries are sitting around the table with the power to do something about it uh, now that we've discovered the vaccine, we have not set out the comprehensive plan that will deliver vaccination by the middle of next year. Uh, Boris Johnson said on Sunday that this would be the greatest feat in medical history. He said it was the great challenge of post-war history. Well, I'm afraid there will be smiles, but there are not solutions. Millions of people will go unvaccinated and thousands of people, I'm afraid, will die. To be fair, this is not just uh, Boris Johnson, of course. Uh, Mr. Biden, Mr. Macron, uh, Mr. Merkel, they've all <coughs> agreed to this. Uh, this is, um, if you want to put it that way, a comprehensive global failure then, isn't it? Well, uh, Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Trudeau did a, a letter to the Financial Times only two days ago in which they said they wanted the G7 to share the cost, 67% of the cost, which is about 50 billion over two years of vaccinating and protecting the world with testing and protective equipment. Now, I'll wait to see the final communique, but it looks as if there is a huge gap between what Boris Johnson promised last Sunday and what is actually being delivered. And I'm afraid it is a gap in funding. And I'm afraid it also comes back to the British cuts in overseas aid, that we're not prepared to put up enough money to deal with problems that the world faces, even when uh, the benefits in extra economic activity, if the world gets back to growth and trade, uh, far outweigh the costs of doing this. Uh, and, and so Boris Johnson really has got to think, are we to leave this problem uh, to the G20, to next year or the year after? Because on the basis of the evidence I see, uh, the whole world will not be vaccinated by the middle of 2022. Uh, and we will have a huge problem of a division between the richest countries that are safe and the poorest countries that are not safe. But then the problem will come back to haunt the richest countries because we will have contagion spreading that may hurt even the people who are vaccinated. Uh, because of mutations and variants. Is it just a matter of funding, though? We heard the Foreign Secretary saying earlier that this is also a question of the mechanism. So, for example, do you really trust the World Health Organization to be able to uh, dispense that level of vaccination, the 11 billion or whatever number you choose, uh, that uh, you think is ideal? 
Well, it's at least 11 billion, and it's not just the WHO who's saying that. Uh, every government that's involved in what's called COVAX accepts that these are the figures. You know, what we did in Britain was the right way to do when we're facing the problems of the world. What you do is you put up the money, you pre-order the vaccines, you then build up the manufacturing capacity, and then you have factories, in this case, in every continent. And unless you have this virtuous circle, which starts with the guarantee of funding, uh, then you will not solve the problem. And I fear that the G7 has not only missed this opportunity, but it will take months before the world gets back to discussing this again in the most coherent way. We need a plan. We don't have yet a plan. We're going to have a shortage of vaccines over the summer, and we're still not going to meet the 11 billion that most people who look at this seriously say is needed. One billion is welcome, uh, but faced with the need for 11 billion, really the G7, the richest countries, should have done much more. In your book, um, which is uh, called Seven Ways to Change the World, you said that the pan after the pandemic is over, we'll still have 260 million children not in education. That the problems that we're facing can't all just be put down to COVID, can they? Uh, even if the disease uh, makes those problems worse. Well, the sustainable development goals that Britain signed up to, every country signed up to, say, everybody in education by the year 2030. Now, Britain has done a lot in the past. We've offered to fund the education of 40 million with the G7 countries, but that's 40 million girls. But there will be 400 million girls leaving school uh, or not at school over the next few years, leaving school without qualifications. So, again, we're dealing with only a fraction of the problem. It's the gap, Trevor, between the promises that the international community makes, Boris Johnson made on Sunday, and the reality that when it comes to it, yes, there'll all be smiles at the end of the summit, uh, but where's the substance when we need to get the vaccinations in place, we need to get children back to school, we need obviously also to deal with this escalating problem of poverty around the world. There are 150 million more people in poverty since the start of the crisis, and that's 150 million people who don't really have the food that they need to survive. Oh. A quick question about uh, domestic uh, policies, as it were. Um, the Irish Prime Minister told us this morning that he thought a solution to the Northern Ireland Protocol issue was possible. Where, what would you be proposing were you in the uh, Prime Minister's seat today? This can only be solved by people getting around the table and talking about it. Uh, there are difficulties in administration, uh, but the protocol will not change, in my view, over the next few months. You know, when I was Prime Minister, even at the height of the financial crisis, I spent days in Northern Ireland talking to all the parties, listening to their complaints, their queries, answering some of their problems. And this needs time. It needs a Prime Minister who is prepared to spend the time speaking to people in every part of Northern Ireland, as well as speaking to the Government of Ireland and the European Union. And it can't be done simply by a few statements that uh, uh, the protocol may need to be looked at again, or alternatively, that someone else has got to solve the problem for him. He's got to spend the time, and it's only the Prime Minister, I'm afraid, and it does come back to who's in charge. Uh, you can't solve this Northern Ireland problem without the Prime Minister engaging it with the fullest attention that will be needed as the G7 summit finishes. But subtly, uh, without any great fanfare, the truth is that what they say in Northern Ireland, or some people say in Northern Ireland, is that this is all undermining Northern Ireland's place in the Union. Do you not fear that drift to uh, separate, separatism? Well, I think uh, Boris Johnson, again, has got to understand that this is a union of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And each part of that union has got its own uh, cultural traditions, its own sensitivities, its own needs and its own aspirations. Uh, and you've got to work at this. <laughs> the job of a prime minister, and perhaps he's the only person that can d do it, he or she, is to unite the whole country, to bring people together. Uh, I believe there should be a forum that brings together the nations and the regions in a more systematic way so that common problems are discussed, chaired by the prime minister. Uh, but you can't assume that the United uh, Kingdom is going to hold together if you don't work at it. And that demands efforts at cooperation, policies for cooperation, instruments for cooperation, and of course, a determination that cooperation is going to work. In your book, 
Um, if we can return to the global situation, Henry Kissinger talks about a new Cold War between liberal democracies and authoritarian states, by which he means Russia and China. Do you agree with that analysis? And if so, what can we do to avoid it? Or is it inevitable? I think he's right, I think he's right about the risk. Uh, and the risk is even greater than he's describing. It's one world, two systems. It's not just a Cold War, it's people moving in a completely different direction. One international monetary fund for the West, one for Asia, one World Bank for the West, one for Asia, one currency uh, or set of currencies dominating in the West, one in Asia. And I think we've got to avoid that. Uh, I have always stood out against the human rights policies of China. We had a human rights dialogue with China, but I've always also said that where we can agree, like on climate change, like on actually uh, a plan to vaccinate the world, uh, like on, on dealing with some of the huge global problems we face, including economic growth in the poorest countries, we have to find a way to work together. I suspect that's what Joe Biden wants to do amidst the, the fiery rhetoric against China. He believes there are areas where you can cooperate, and you should, but also areas where you've got to say very clearly, we disagree entirely with what you're doing, uh, and we will try to persuade you to change your mind but you have to concentrate in a world as fragile as this, where we have huge okay. problems that are global. We have to concentrate on finding ways to work together where we can. OK, we have a, we have a very short time, but I, I don't think I can let you go without asking you a question about Scotland and Labour. Um, no, it's not an argument that Labour probably is not where it would like to be in polls and... Uh, elections, looking at the recent local elections, the prospect of losing badly and so on. But a big issue for the Labour Party is its position in Scotland, which is dire. What should Labour be doing to re restore and regain its status in Scotland? Well, we've got to show that we're both the party of social justice and that the Scottish National Party are not delivering that despite all their promises, and we're the party of solidarity. Uh, in, in, in this interdependent world, there is no future in nations that are neighbouring nations fighting each other. And I fear 50 years of conflict between Scotland and England if we don't get these problems sorted out. So we have got to be the party of solidarity, of talking about empathy, reciprocity, cooperation and sharing. And of course, we've found during the vaccination effort that when we cooperate, we get things done. British uh, pre-purchasing... Scottish delivery in Scotland of the vaccine. Now, that's a way forward on health, but it's a way forward on climate change, which cannot be solved without countries working together, and the recovery, where jobs are going to be needed to be created, and we need all the resources of the United Kingdom in, in every part of the United Kingdom put to work. Gordon Brown, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you, Trevor. Well, I referred to it uh, on a couple of occasions already. Uh, the Irish Prime Minister, uh, Michael Martin, has spoken uh, on the issue of Northern Ireland and the EU. Uh, and he did that in an interview with my Sky News colleague, David Blevins. Here is what the Irish Prime Minister had to say. He said the UK government said it was... Uh, surprised the EU was enforcing the protocol, those checks in the Irish Sea, as emphatically as it is. Does that surprise you? Um, well, it does in a sense that I think the, the UK government are under no illusions about where the EU is coming from in relation to the protocol. But the European Union is willing and uh, very engaged in endeavouring to find a resolution to the issues that have been raised uh, in respect of the, the Northern Ireland, uh, Ireland protocol. Um, and in my view, the channels do exist to get this resolved. Uh, and in particular, the Sefcovic uh, Frost um, process should be fully uh, explored and, and optimised to, to get an agreement. And I think uh, the prospects, in my view, if there's a will there on both sides, and there is a will there from the European Union side, I know that. I detect from the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, the British government is anxious to get a resolution of this. Uh, so I think we should, we should work at it. That's more hopeful than we've heard for quite a while. There's still a lot of point scoring going on over Brexit. So is there not a danger of the politics thwarting attempts to find solutions? I think we need to move beyond where we are. Uh, I think from my understanding of a lot of the technical issues that have been discussed, progress can be made on quite a lot of the issues. Uh, I believe the US administration's comments last week, which were released uh, uh, are interesting as well insofar as they deal with a significant issue that would concern the British government, i.e. the 
uh, capacity to do a trade deal with the United States whilst also having uh, an SPS uh, arrangement between the European Union and the United Kingdom. Uh, and in my view, uh, there's a legitimate issue there for the United Kingdom government, but in our view, an SPS agreement would deal with up to 80% of all of these issues. And I think it's, it's a prize worth uh, certainly exploring uh, in the fullest manner possible. To what extent do you understand the US administration chastised the British government for the perceived threat, at least, to the peace process? And do you believe President Biden perhaps has a further role to play in help, helping to broker a solution? I wouldn't see it as a chastisement or anything like that. I think the, the US president is very clear on restoring the transatlantic relationship between America and, and the European Union and America and the United Kingdom. He sees UK, Europe and the US aligned on the fundamentals of democracy, freedom of speech. And that's very important. And so he really wants the EU, EU and the UK to resolve this issue. He's also then, of course, as we know, absolutely committed to the Good Friday Agreement, the full working of the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement. And he doesn't want discussions around the protocol uh, to, to undermine the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, and, and he also wants to see full engagement. Uh, and he believes there's a way and a route, as I do, uh, to getting these issues resolved. And I, I think he, the big picture for him is to be fully aligned uh, on the big uh, issues of the day globally between the EU, America and the United Kingdom uh, and that really issues of this sort should be, should be uh, sorted. You mentioned the Good Friday Agreement. Your government and indeed the EU has repeatedly argued that a border on the island of Ireland would pose a threat to the Good Friday Agreement. But with now thousands of loyalists protesting at times on the street, some of them masked, does a border in the Irish Sea not pose just as much of a threat to that agreement? Well, again, I think the, the nature of Brexit has been challenging in that respect, OK, in terms of the absence of a customs union and that. But in our view, an SPS agreement could deal with a lot of the issues around food, uh, animal welfare and, 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 and so on. And in my view, given the challenges, uh, given the necessity to reduce tensions, we've never seen the protocol as a constitutional issue. It doesn't in any way interfere with the constitutional status of Northern Ireland as defined and articulated within the Good Friday Agreement. We're very clear from the Irish government perspective on that. Um, but we do believe in seamless trade on the island of Ireland. It makes sense. We believe in seamless trade uh, so far as we possibly can between the United Kingdom and, and Northern Ireland. We think Northern Ireland's economy can develop over time through its access to the UK market, obviously, but also access to the European Union market. If you look at the dairy industry, for example, I mean, milk comes north, south uh, seamlessly without any issues. That's important for Ulster farmers. It's important for, for, for the industry, both sides of the border. Uh, it's that kind of practical um, trade that we want to encourage. Uh, we do acknowledge that issues have arisen that are causing concern. We believe those issues can be dealt with in the context of the discussions between the European Union and the United Kingdom, and we're willing to play a helpful role in that. Time is not on your side. Now, if there is no deal by the 1st of July and the British government unilaterally for a third time extends the grace period, this time for chilled meats, to avoid this so-called sausage war, what way would you expect the EU to respond to that? I think it would be very problematic because it's not about sausages per se. It really is about the fact that an agreement had been entered into not too long ago, signed off by the British government with the European Union, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, including the withdrawal agreement and the protocol. And that creates, a, if just consistent unilateral deviation from that agreement, that clearly undermines the broader relationship between the European Union and the United Kingdom, uh, which is in nobody's interest. Uh, and therefore, that's why uh, the UK uh, with the EU have to work very hard now in, in the coming weeks. I know the European Union are anxious to resolve this uh, and want to resolve it, but that, that they need to see a, a similar reciprocity from the, from, from the UK side. So just to be clear, you believe SPS agreement is now the solution and would you be hopeful that because President Biden has assured the British government that that wouldn't prevent a trade deal, that they may now consider that seriously? I think it, it is a significant part of the solution. I think they should consider it very seriously uh, and I think it could lead um, um, to, to a breakthrough on this. Just one final question. I'm conscious that Arlene Foster is preparing to formally resign as First Minister of Northern Ireland. How concerned are you that her ousting as DUP leader could destabilise the power sharing administration? Well, first of all, I want to thank Arlene and pay a warm tribute to her for her commitment to public life and to public service over so many years, and particularly laterally in her capacity as First Minister and leader of the DUP. Uh, I had a good relationship with Arlene 
over the years, but when I was Minister for Foreign Affairs over a decade ago in the context of the devolution of justice. Uh, and I wish Arlene well now uh, in terms with her family in terms of the next stage of, of her journey in, in life. Uh, and I've also met with Edwin Putz, uh, had a good meeting with him in Dublin uh, last week. Uh, and I believe that he is committed to the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement, to uh, fulfilling all of the obligations on, that we all have collectively. Uh, so my, I'm, I'm uh, of a view that we can uh, you know, safeguard the institutions and progress the various sets of relationships that are encompassed by the uh, Good Friday Agreement itself. So I think uh, you know, there have been many twists and turns in terms of the peace process, in terms of politics. Uh, in Northern Ireland, the island of Ireland, and between Britain and Ireland. Uh, and it, it falls on those of us who are in positions of, of influence and positions of leadership uh, to engage with each other uh, and to work together to resolve the, the challenges that come our way. Taoiseach, thank you for your time. You're very welcome indeed. Thank you. Ireland's Prime Minister Michal Martin speaking, I thought rather optimistically, to our colleague David Blevins. Now, the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, when he spoke to me earlier, was pretty cagey on the issue of reopening on June 21st, but I think that the Prime Minister gave a pretty strong signal uh, earlier on this weekend that he was aiming to be cautious. Now, it all comes as COVID cases start to climb again and a new surge, potentially, uh, fueled by the Delta variant first identified in India. Well, to talk more about whether June 21st uh, is going to be Freedom Day or not, we're joined by the government's independent advisor on COVID and ethnicity, Dr. Rahib Ali. Uh, Dr. Ali, do you think that progress uh, along the roadmap has now been derailed by the Delta variant? Uh, good morning, Trevor, and uh, thank you for having me on the programme this morning. Just before I answer that, Trevor, I just wanted to mention something about the general approach that I've taken you know, throughout this pandemic as to whether we should have uh, ongoing restrictions or lifting restrictions. And <clears throat> the approach I've always taken is that we have to look at the overall kind of benefits and harms of, of a particular policy. And we're trying to minimize overall harm. So of course, you know, there are potential harms from COVID if it's allowed to get out of control in cases and hospitalization and deaths increase. But of course, there are also potential harms from ongoing restrictions. And over the last 18 months, I've consistently called for restrictions generally to be lifted earlier, particularly last summer when I felt that schools were closed for too long and, and we could have reopened sooner. So having said all that, uh, it's true that the situation has really changed over the last two weeks. I mean, two weeks ago when I was asked the same question, I said it was just too early to, uh, to tell. We needed to look at what data would materialize over these two weeks. But unfortunately, over the last uh, few days, what has become very clear is that cases, because of the Delta variant, which really has transformed the situation, cases are increasing rapidly, doubling almost every week in some places. But the key factor is now the hospitalizations are also increasing. Fortunately, not at the same rate as we saw back in waves one on waves two, um, but they are increasing uh, at a sufficient rate that we need to be very cautious going forward. What would you like the Prime Minister to say when he speaks tomorrow? It sounds like you think you would urge delay. And if so, for how long? So the reason I think a delay is inevitable now is because, as I said, what we're seeing now in hospitals, hospitals are extremely busy at the moment. And the emergency departments last month were the busiest they have been you know, for, for years um, because there's a huge backlog of patients that didn't come in during the, the peaks, uh, particularly the second wave, partly because they were worried about catching COVID and also because they didn't want to put pressure on the NHS. So having a huge number of people coming to the emergency departments, as well as dealing with this huge waiting list and backlog. And so even a relatively small increase in hospital admissions for COVID will have a significant impact on all our non-COVID patients, all our cancer patients, heart patients, et cetera. And we really can't afford you know, to for those people to suffer anymore. They have already suffered uh, enough over the last 18 months. So what I expect the Prime Minister uh, to say is that based on that data, unfortunately, a, a, a delay is needed to make sure that we don't get to a situation again where the NHS is unable to provide care to all its patients. I mean, this, this slogan that we've had over the last you know, 18 months of protecting the NHS, it's not about protecting hospitals or doctors or, or workers here. It's really about protecting our non-COVID patients. That's really the key. And uh, that's what we need to ensure we don't get into that problem again. And the second point really is So that, in essence, what you're, you're... Sorry, so carry on. No, no, it's okay. 
Um, I was going to say the irreversibility really is, is key as well, as the Prime Minister has stressed. I think the worst thing for all of us and for the economy, for hospitality, for our mental and physical health would be to go backwards, you know, to, to re to go back to before we were before step three, at least with step three, we're able to visit you know, family and, and friends and to me and to go out, etc. So the last thing we want uh, is to have to go backwards. Do you think that there is um, any value in, for example, uh, closing schools at this point? No, certainly not. I think children uh, have suffered hugely over the last uh, 18 months. And one of the main things I've always stressed is that schools should stay open as long as possible. And I would have wanted them to reopen earlier last year. But the, the other point related to that is that if cases continue to increase, even without hospitalizations, that has a significant impact on the number of children in school. We saw in Bolton before half term, a third of children were off school. Um, and certainly we don't want that to happen across the country. So by keeping cases as low as possible in the coming four weeks while schools are open, that maximizes the chance for all children to be in school until the end of term. And you asked me about the, the amount of time that's required for this delay. I mean, partly because of schools, partly because of what's likely to happen with the NHS. You know, it seems that a four week delay would be optimal. It allows us to vaccinate millions more people, both with first and second doses. And the good news is that, you know, in places like Bolton, we saw that where we increased vaccination and testing and people took more care, we were able to bring this third wave under control. And although hospitalizations did increase, it didn't get as high as the, the second or first wave. Dr Ali, thank you very much. Pretty clear message there. Delay, keep children in school, and we'll get out of it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So let's return to the G7 summit uh, here in Cornwall. Gordon Brown was pretty damning about the failure of the world's leaders to do enough to get vaccines to the developing world. Um, that follows criticism from a number of Conservative MPs uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, about plans to cut fo the foreign aid budget, um, another way that the UK supports poorer nations. Well, leading the charge amongst those Conservative MPs is the former International Development Secretary, Andrew Mitchell, and he joins us now. Andrew Mitchell, um, what did you think of what uh, Dominic Raab said earlier on about why he thought that the billion vaccines on the schedule that they're proposing is pretty much the best you're going to get? Well, I think the summit has been extremely successful in focusing on the key issues. And I think the Prime Minister deserves great credit for having got the other six leaders of the richest countries in the world to focus on the things that really matter, particularly in the middle of a, a global pandemic. So I think as far as it goes, those issues are the ones which we now need to uh, really push forward. And, the, the, and really the question is this, uh, is there enough money, these are the richest countries in the world, is there enough money to drive forward the vaccination of the world, which is the Prime Minister's ambition, and upon which our national interests and our welfare depend in the future? Um, and I think the jury so far is out on that. We'll see whether or not the summit communique uh, commits the richest countries to step up to the plate. And, of course, I have to say it's been more difficult for the Prime Minister to do that when in the previous two uh, global summits uh, in, in Birmingham and in Glen Eagles in Britain, Britain really led from the front on, on development, on tackling poverty, on bringing the world together on that agenda. It's been more difficult to do that this time because Britain is the only G7 country that is reversing that, is cutting its aid, when all the others are either increasing it or at least keeping it uh, at the same level. And, and the impact of that is very severe and it will impact not only our ability to achieve these objectives, but also to tackle the global pandemic. One example I would give you is this, that we are, we are slashing spending on clean water and sanitation, which is actually absolutely critical to combating uh, the pandemic. And as a result of this 80% cut by Britain on water and sanitation, 10 million of the poorest people will not this year get access to it. I, I put that point actually to Dominic Raab uh, earlier on, and he said, well, you know, we have to balance the needs of the economy and, of course, security, where we're spending more money on uh, soldiers. He used, we used the example of Mali. And uh, we're doing as much as we can do. Um, do you buy that? 
Well, you know, the, in the scheme of things, this cut is 1% of what we spent tackling COVID, quite rightly, last year. It's 1%, and it's the only cut that was announced in the otherwise excellent comprehensive spending review last November. And it's not a cut we have to make. And in, in comparison with anything else, as I say, it's a very small amount of money, but the impact it's going to have, not just, you know, on, on the poorest people in the world, which will be huge, but also on Britain's reputation and Britain's ability to move the dial on these very important is international issues will be, be great. And I, I heard what the Foreign Secretary said about uh, Mali, but I, I thought that the point you made was a very good one. If you put uh, 200, 300 troops in harm's way in, in Mali, but you also scrap much of the international development programme across that area of Sahel, which means you take away the hope and the optimism of, of women to be able to get access to birth control, of children to go to school, of, of, of communities that are teetering on the edge of starvation. You take that away. It actually acts as a sort of recruiting sergeant for the terrorist message. And, and that's not a good position when you're putting British troops into that sort of uh, theatre. It sounds like you are putting the government on a warning and that you are going to be back. Uh, with an attempt to restore that 0.7% uh, development budget, 0.7% of, the, of uh, gross domestic product development budget that the government has reduced to 0.5%. Is that right? You're going to be back for another go? Yes, we are, and the government should, should accept the olive branch we suggested in Parliament, which is to bring back the 0.7 from January next year, when the economy will have rebounded. We've seen the excellent economic news, thanks to the Chancellor's good stewardship of our economy, uh, in, even in today's uh, papers. Um, but we've, we've got to be really, really careful about this, and the government should listen to its friends. We are supporters of the government. We are campaigners for the Conservative Party. We are people who've got the government's best interests at heart. And we urge the government to listen to what the House of Commons is saying. The government does not command the House of Commons on this issue. Last week, they would have lost a vote had it uh, gone ahead. And the, the government should listen to what its friends are saying, accept the olive branch and bring back the point seven, as we all promised at the last general election, as soon as possible and preferably in January next year. Some of the government's other friends are not saying what you're saying. What they're saying is... We can't afford to spend the money that we need to get our children to catch up for the education that they've lost in the last 18 months. Um, and in the red wall, what they're saying, uh, red wall seats, what the, the, the Tories have just recently uh, acquired, that what they're saying is, why are we spending money on other nations' children when we can't even educate our own? I, I am very clear that we need to do both those two things. And, you know, we've been joined by uh, quite a large number of brilliant colleagues from these red wall seats. The, Boris has spread the DNA of the Tory party very well into the red wall seats. We've won seats we've never had before. And I campaigned in some of them in the West Midlands. And when I asked people whether they were... Uh, voting Conservative, they said, no, I'm voting for Boris. So, you know, he has widened the Tory party's DNA very well. But we mustn't forget the lessons we learnt in 2015. It took the Tory party 23 years to win an overall majority in Parliament, 1992 to 2015. And the reason we won in 2015 was because the Tory party's DNA embraced internationalism. It embraced uh, the very important message to many people on international development and on the importance of tax these quite extraordinary discrepancies of wealth and opportunity which disfigure our world and which our generations are able to do so much about. Um, and that, that meant that all those liberal seats and people who were sort of on the margins of the Tory party, they came and they supported the Tory message because it was a broad church. And what we've got to be very careful about is we don't add this extra very important DNA at one end and lose it at the other end because we turn our backs on two decades where... Britain under both parties. It hasn't been a sort of Labour or Conservative policy. It's been a policy of Britain to, to really lead the world on tackling international development. That's not only about money, it's also about the policy generation from our great universities and think tanks. But Britain has had that leadership centrally, and it's been very noticeable. You know, you only have to look at the briefings during this G7 summit that that leadership and that thrust has not been there because we've broken our promise on the point seven. But Andrew Mitchell, um, you, you, you're a former 
Chief Whip, you can count the numbers as well as anybody else. And actually, Boris Johnson has a bigger majority than any Conservative leader for some time. And actually, he is way ahead in the polls. Is your real worry here, um, a longer-term one, that the cut to international development money will make the Tories look like what people used to say they are, the nasty party? Uh, I think that the Tory party is full of volunteers who are part of the great NGO alliance, Crack the Crises, which, you know, has got more than 10 million supporters. And often, you know, Conservative uh, branch uh, officers are also the people who help run Oxfam and Save the Children and other great charities throughout our country. We are, we are a big-hearted, broad party that really care about these issues. And, and I worry that in the in the rather mean and almost Dickensian approach to our development spend, where we've cut it in the middle of a pandemic in breach of the promises we all made, all 650 of us at the last general election, uh, arguably in breach of the law. Very senior lawyers in Britain have said that this, this is unlawful because it's not missing the target, it's changing the target to 0.5. And also the promises we made to the United Nations and on the floor of the General Assembly. I, I think it's very bad for Britain's but, image, but above all, it's, it's bad for the party and it's bad for our reputation and our ability to move the dial in some very wretched and poor parts of the world. Very last quick question about June 21st, because it's a big signal whether the government decides it wants to coexist and will open up or whether it is going to be cautious and... Stick, keep to try, try to suppress the virus even further. Where are you standing on this? Are you looking forward to um, weddings with more than 30 people and being out in a barbecue where you don't have to wear a mask? Well, my own, my own lovely daughter has had to delay her wedding now for the second year, so she's, had, she's going to have to wait two years now before she's able to marry her partner. So I feel very, very, very strongly for people whose weddings have been postponed uh, in that way. And I feel desperately sorry for the hospitality industry throughout the royal town of Sutton Coalfield, which has suffered so grievously. But I think we must follow the science. And I have great faith that the Prime Minister will reach the right conclusions. So I'm looking forward to hearing what, he, what his judgment is tomorrow. Andrew Mitchell, thank you very much indeed.